Good day to all of our investors and guests. This is our holiday edition of the Rudd Commentary Podcast. My name is Josh Rudd, and I'm the managing partner of Steer Wealth. With me today is Jack Herr from our investment team. And I'd also like to welcome Caitlin, our new producer for this podcast. How is everybody? We're good. Glad to be here. Great. For our new listeners who may not be familiar with who we are at Steer Wealth, we manage investments for successful families, high-performing professionals, and organizations across the country and become your wealth manager, confidant, and personal CFO so you can relax and focus your time and energy on what is important to you. So, Jack, how's your uh, Christmas shopping going so far? It's good, Josh. I'm actually finished um, in the earliest I have been for the last few years, so I'm pretty happy with that. Got all my gifts picked out and uh, looking forward to the holiday season. Well, you're a better man than I am because it's amazing how I, you know, time just flies by and you you know kind of get behind and then you always wake up in the middle of the night and go oh my gosh I forgot to get this and for most of us we search on Amazon and make sure there's stuff still arriving before Christmas right yeah that or you go to the (laughs) store and you you see all the other guys scrambling around that's right before we get started we can't move forward without asking a very important question Jack what do you call a blind reindeer Uh, I wasn't expecting the joke today I don't know Josh what what do you call it I have no idea. (laughs) All right, I'll give you some credit. That that one was pretty good. (laughs) So I think Mr. Clark Griswold would definitely approve that one. But uh, before we get too much off the beaten path here, I'd like to get a market update from you and kind of see what's going on before the end of the year. So what has Mr. Market got in store for Santa this year? Yeah, Josh, well, it's been a long year, hasn't it? And I know a lot of our listeners and, and investors may be a little worn down. Of course, you know, we talk about the performance month to month here on the podcast, but it's been a long year and, and this drawdown has, has certainly taken its toll on all of us. But I'm here to, to talk about some trends for today. And then also, I know we want to talk about interest rates. So in that line of thinking, I just want to talk about what the Federal Reserve did in December. We did see a 50 basis point increase in December after multiple 75 basis point increases over the second half of the year. Main thing we saw here and with some of the Fed commentary is there's not too many signs of slowing down, right? They're going to continue to get this inflation thing under control. They want rates to be high for now, but at least the increases are starting to get a little smaller. I don't know how long that'll last, of course. You know, they can certainly change their tune in early 2023, but Josh, that's mostly what we saw towards the end of the year. So you're going to tell our listeners about the office pool to see if the Fed actually does pivot sometime in 2023. Yeah, I know we all have our bets in, but uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens. It's hard to predict. So the impact of those higher rates has certainly been felt in the market, like I mentioned. And one thing I really wanted to point out was that difference between how growth investments have performed and how value investments have performed. Definitely, yes. This is something we've talked about on the podcast often. Now that we are starting to get a good idea where we're going to end up this year, I just wanted to touch on it again and just give some numbers here to talk about the truly historic gap we've seen between these type of investments. So we're seeing a nearly 20% gap between some of these growth investments that did really, really well during COVID and some of the value investments. Maybe some of our clients will refer to these as boring investments, but really to us, they've been the investments that have been stable, have been able to pay a dividend, produce free cash flow, and use their cash on the balance sheet to keep producing values to investors. So Josh, just something I thought was very interesting. Certainly many of our investors are probably aware of this as well. Absolutely. And so for our investors who may have not followed Jack as closely in that segment, it's very important what he's referring to is really the difference between some of the major indexes that you've seen, the performance. For example, Jack, the Dow Jones Industrial Average this year, which is also down, but not quite as much as the NASDAQ, which for the growth investments is down, last time I looked, around 30% year to date, Jack. Yeah, and that's looking like where that's going to end up. So very yeah, big it's uh, the gr- the growth and the value trade has been something that's really highlighted some of the inconsistencies and in rebalancing that needs to take place, that has taken place, and that needs to continue to take place in the overall market. So I'm glad you brought that up. Anything else that's happened this year in the markets that you wanted to highlight before the end of the year? No, really just want to let our investors know that this time of year, you do see a lot of trading. You may see some volatility towards the end of the year. You know, a lot of tax planning going on, certain investors taking losses. So just something to keep in mind. There may be some volatility towards the end of the year, but nothing in particular besides interest rates, which we're going to talk about today. Well, great, Jack. Let's get started. 
Yeah, so I wanted to go through, Josh, and ask you a few questions here regarding interest rates. We've talked a little bit about the negative and how it's affected returns, but there are some opportunities, right, when we see these higher rates and some of these opportunities we haven't seen for over a decade. So, Josh, what are some of the benefits of higher rates? Well, that's what we all want to know, right? So I think this part of the interest rate discussion is the most obvious and visible for a lot of our listeners. I'm going to go into things that may not seem so obvious and some benefits and consequences that may be a little hidden from our investors. But let's go ahead and start out with you know the elephant in the room, right? Rates are higher. So it makes sense that if you're listening to my podcast today and you have money in a savings account, or if you're a retiree and you're relying on income, Jack, wouldn't it make sense that you should be getting a higher savings rate on those dollars? Yeah, money seems to be more expensive. It seems logical. Yeah, so um, if you're sitting and you've got some cash, which most of us do, in a savings account, or you've been reluctant to buy CDs, or you've got some type of pension or Social Security income that's adjusted to a cost of living index, it makes sense that that income should be higher. So I'm going to break this down into what I call direct result of higher rates and more of an incidental. And these are, let's start with the positive. You'd ask about the benefits. So Number one, the most direct benefit is just getting a higher rate on your savings. So as we discussed before, if you're getting money sitting in a bank account, you got cash, you got a CD, you're holding treasury bonds, you're probably getting a higher rate than you were a year ago, unless uh, you tied your money up and you can't reinvest it, <laughs> which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and the last is just a higher income rate for retirees on certain types of fixed income pensions and Social Security and whatnot. The next thing, though, that I'd like to talk about, Jack, is the thing that A lot of investors really don't think about what are some of the incidental benefits to investors from a higher rate environment. Everybody talks about why rates are bad. Let's just run through a few things. So we've all talked about high inflation, right? This year, it's kind of been the discussion if you read the financial news or if you watch, you know, TV or you've you've been following social media. So there's a possibility with higher rates that we could see inflation back off a little bit and at least a not so much a falling environment with deflation, but we could see a lower rate of increase on inflation and possibly see those inflationary numbers even come down a little bit down the road. So another benefit, Jack, is really just to cool off in the real estate market. You know, we've been seeing these housing prices and commercial properties just going crazy, right? The prices have been increasing. It's been real hard for buyers to negotiate and get deals done. It's been really a seller's market. And I think that rising rates have really jostled that market a little bit in a good way, at least for buyers to be able to be competitive. I mean, cash flow debt service has definitely gone up and we'll talk about that in a minute, but this will try to bring the real estate market back into balance. So I think that's a definitely a benefit from that perspective. The last thing is for our investors that are traveling overseas, Jack, and you think of a benefit from higher interest rates in the U.S. that might benefit our investors that are thinking of planning that trip to Germany or Salzburg or some uh, exotic location outside the U.S.? Yeah, Josh. Well, as someone who went to Europe earlier this year, the dollar was a little bit stronger. My money went a longer way than it usually would. And that's exactly right, Jack. So those of you that are traveling overseas, you probably noticed one of the incidental benefits to those higher rates is the dollar has been a little stronger. And that may not last forever, and it may have turned a little bit here recently as we've been watching. But the point is is that the dollar has had some strength recently, and your dollar may be buying a little more, as you said, when you're on that vacation over in Europe. Yeah, Josh. Well, I want to come back to that second point you made about real estate coming down as a younger guy that definitely hits home with me. And I feel like a lot of millennials who are maybe looking for that first home and haven't been able to because prices have been high for so long. So definitely hits home there. Yeah. And I want to comment on that. I do understand for some of you listening that you may be thinking that, well, yeah, that, that's all well and good, but my borrowing costs went up as well. Really what I'm talking about these 20 and 30% increases per year in a lot of these properties. I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? The ability to even negotiate as a buyer for a house that you and your new family may be looking for, Jack. That's what we're talking about. We understand that the servicing cost is going up as interest rates going up, but you haven't been able to be competitive as a buyer in in several years. And it's nice to see that market uh, at least attempting to come into balance. Yeah, I agree. And you touched on it there, shortly about the consequences of higher rates and the first being that money is just harder to borrow now and i think that's the most obvious consequence that a lot of our investors has seen right they're making a big purchase a house a car whatever it may be and they see you know when when they try to 
finance that type of purchase. They're paying more in interest. So let's talk a little bit about consequences, both the obvious and maybe some of the consequences our investors aren't thinking about, particularly when choosing investments in the market. Jack, that's it, right? It's it's very frustrating when you go and you plan to buy a home or a car and you've done all those calculations and then you basically have to double the interest rate. And that's really, Jack, what we've seen in the mortgage market the last 12 months or so. We've seen interest rates go from a three-handle to a six-handle. So they really have doubled, and it's increased the borrowing cost for many investors or many prospective home buyers out there. So the reality of the situation is that it now costs something to borrow money. So we have to consider that now for the first time in a long time. I mean, you know, 3%, 2.9 on a mortgage issue, yeah, sure, that's a little bit of an interest expense. But when you go up to 6 and 7, that really changes the ballgame here. So it now costs us, you know, debt service to borrow money. And American consumers, Jack, <laughs> we've been the best in the world at using credit to spend beyond our means. And really, especially over the last decade, when you think about it in this very low interest rate environment. So I think the most direct consequence of the interest rates going up, Jack, is just that consumer decisions to purchase just about anything are going to be affected. And I think the most obvious are going to be houses and cars. And those are the things that we think of as the big ticket items. But I really believe that investors and consumers need to think about just the more infrequent and less thought of purchases. And I want to focus on a couple of things. Let's talk first about a home HVAC or air conditioning system. A lot of these systems in the residential market, believe it or not, are financed. And yeah, sure, the large companies will provide attractive financing to sell these high-priced units. But you get to a point to where the cost of borrowing money goes up enough, it really does impact your ability to get that transaction done. And when you're thinking about a system, an HVAC system, you're thinking about a purchase that you pretty much have to do, or it's very compelling to do, right? Especially if you live here in Texas. It's 105 outside, and your air conditioning goes down, and you got to buy a new system. If that system costs you eighteen to $20,000, a lot of just middle-class Americans don't have that sitting in their checking account ready to stroke a check for. So I believe that's just a huge direct consequence of larger rates. And when you think about it, it's not just high ticket items. I mean, we've been talking about homes and cars, and now we're talking about a HVAC system. But think about the decisions you make to buy a cell phone, you know, to renew your plan with any major carrier. A lot of those payment terms were uh, constructed based on very low borrowing costs by these companies. And it's something that we may have forgotten about. Everything from cell phones to clothing, really to anything that's directly or indirectly financed. And when I say indirectly, think of the cell phone. You don't think that you're getting a loan. You just think that you're signing an agreement for a two, three-year contract and you're getting that phone at a discounted rate or in some cases for free. But Jack, the most direct impact is a lot of those deals are going to be harder to get done and some of them may just go away and you may not be able to get them done. So I think that's going to catch the consumer a lot by surprise. As far as indirect, when we're looking at higher rates, I know from our side of the business and here in the investment environment, the present value of virtually all investment is declining. You know, we're looking at those cash flows over a long period of time, Jack. We've been using these very low or no cost of capital on these uh, investment projections, these projects, these companies have been reviewing for investment. So what you're going to see is you're going to see stock and bond investments are going to be under pressure. What does that mean for our listeners? If you're having trouble following me, it just means that the value is going to go down and it's going to reset based on these higher rates. And when you hold the rate of return, all else equal, interest rates go up, the present value of those investments is going to decline. And so that's what you've seen. In fact, the bond market, Jack, has had one of the worst returns in, in the last 80 years. So that's very evident, and that's been easy to measure. It may be unclear to a lot of investors as to why, but it really has to do directly with interest rates first. So you see everything from those stock and bond values to new business projects. If you're a CEO, maybe you don't take on a project because interest rates are higher and the cost of capital is higher. Maybe you don't invest in new plant and equipment, Jack, because your capital expenditures are now more expensive because you're not able to finance them on the best terms. And I think the easiest thing for most of us to wrap our head around and a lot of our investors that are listening is just when you think about it in terms of real estate investments, what if you were a real estate investor and the cost of you buying that rental property just doubled? And rent may be a little stickier. Maybe rent doesn't quite keep up. So it may price you out of the market. You may do the math on a certain purchase and say, you know, 
this deal just doesn't make sense until prices come down a little bit. And so like you and I were discussing before, there's a lot of moving parts. So I would say in general, the indirect consequences, this economy is most likely out of balance and it's going to take some rebalancing, Jack, which uh, could mean a recession. Yeah, Josh, and I think you put that really well. And a few things you hinted at there is just the speed it's happened at, right? You'd say it's nearly doubled this year, most rates when you're borrowing. And, and that's true. But also a lot of players in this economy, they haven't seen this type of increase ever. Maybe they've you know only ever seen low rates. That's all they know. So I think a lot of people, you know, as we approach this holiday season, the reality has been that rates are higher they have doubled and it's just one of those situations where it's how are we going to adapt and like you said that's the the end result may be a recession yes and uh, just to continue on that point a little longer you know how we were talking earlier jack about how our dollar is a little stronger overseas yeah one of the things that you may not think about if you're listening and you just got back from your trip to london or you know some somewhere overseas is that that stronger dollar puts a lot of pressure on our industrial producers here in the U.S. And part of the reason is it makes our exports a lot more expensive. The relationship between interest rates and exports and the economy and credit, it's, it's all interconnected. It's this tapestry, right? And it's very delicate. And we start pulling on one of these threads like interest rates, and it really changes a lot. And there's a lot that can unravel. The author, uh, Edward Chancellor, put it, the, the price of time is just so important for us to consider. Interest rates, Jack, have been around for a long time. It's not something that we invented here, you know, in the 1900s. I mean, in fact, some of the oldest, you know, tablets from Mesopotamia and, you know, I mean, we're talking thousands of years ago, they're related to the rate of interest (laughs) on contracts. And it's, uh, it's amazing when you think about how important that's been. Uh, it's been said that Einstein called compound interest the eighth wonder of the world. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's one of those things you'll find on the Internet if you Google it. I really appreciate that because just assuming that, hey, interest rates have gone up and I'm earning more on my savings account is not the full story. Yeah, Josh, it really is incredible to think about interest rates and, and the impact and the effects of these increases have across our economy. I think you put it correctly when you said it's, it's endless. We could sit here and talk about all the different effects, but this is an investing podcast. So why don't we talk a little bit about how we can modify our expectations for investment returns and, and which strategies can be successful in this type of higher rate environment? Jack, I think that's a really important point. And that's the million dollar question, right? We all want to know what to do now that we're in that higher interest rate environment. And the first thing that investors really need to do is just confront the reality of higher rates. Rates are likely going to be much higher for the foreseeable future. And we have talked about on this show with our clients about the probability of of the Fed pivoting and rates coming back down. I think there is a possibility of that, especially if we go into a full-blown recession. I believe that it's a very high possibility, in fact, that we may see uh, rates come back down a little bit. But we're probably not going back down to the levels that we saw over the last 13 years. So in general, I think you're going to see rates at a much higher level. Inflation will probably also likely settle a little higher at a more normal level. I mean, we've had low interest rates, but, Jack, we've also had a lot of money printing. So that's been something that's been a reality that we have to confront also, the investment returns will probably be lower than we've seen in over the past decade or so. I mean, we've had a great run off the 2009 lows, and that higher interest rate environment, as we talked about, just really changes the math. So I think we need to be ready for that. And one other thing that we need to prepare ourselves for is just a little bit higher volatility. I mean, we've already seen that a little bit. I think that's probably going to continue as the economy is searching for some form of balance that is the result of that we're going to see volatility not just in asset prices interest rates probably in legislation as our politicians try to figure out what the heck's going on uh, rather unsuccessfully i might add (laughs) so let's get to your question though Uh, i know our listeners are probably eager to hear you know how they should respond in this type of environment So let's talk a little bit about, I think, the biggest risk related to that volatility is it's much harder, Jack, to mitigate risk in this type of environment. And I'll give you an example. If if you're using real estate to diversify your investment portfolio, as you said, it's harder to buy real estate, right? And so it may cost you more money. You may not be able to do that. And so 
it just gets a little more expensive to mitigate risk. I know that's something you and I talk about here, and I won't go into the weeds, but it is more expensive to mitigate all types of risks. So what does that mean to you, the investor? You need to have a higher level of liquidity. And what does liquidity mean? Your ability to access cash, your ability to take advantage of opportunities, to mitigate short-term risk. So hold a little more cash in this type of environment. I think it's wise, some short-term investments. And Jack, as we talked about, interest rates are pretty high. So you've got the ability to do that. Another thing you can do is be smart with your short-term savings in this environment. Jack, you mentioned earlier that banks just haven't caught up with interest rates, right? I mean, what are banks paying right now, even though rates have gone up? Yeah, not much more than zero, honestly. I opened a bank account recently, and I was surprised to find that wasn't much of a return on cash in that account. So a little bit disappointed in that. So investors, you don't have to accept these low interest rates that are at the bank. There are many competitive investment uh, opportunities out there. And, and it's not even really opportunities. They're pretty boring stuff. We told our clients about the Series I savings bonds that have been out there for a while. We've been preaching from the rooftops about that rate. Jack, I know you've been talking up uh, T-bills to our clients over the past at least year to date. We've seen rates in excess uh, of 4% going out to two years. It's just they're readily available. The government has an endless supply of them, and it it's not that difficult. You know, Treasury bills are issued by the U.S. government and, and are guaranteed by the U.S. government for timely payment of interest and principal. You know, they still fluctuate a very small amount when interest rates go up and down, but you know, it's the same government that guarantees CDs, right? So it's a very good option for savers. I think to, just to, uh, to drive home this point, you don't have to accept the low interest rates coming from the banks. I think they're very excited about finally making what's called a margin on their, on their deposit. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, but they're, they're probably not going to be not as aggressive in raising your, your savings uh, rates as you probably wish they would. Uh, so definitely take advantage of those higher rates. The last thing, Jack, that I think we should do in this environment is just adjust our expectations. I believe that, we're, we're, as we said earlier, we're going to see those lower returns in equity investments, uh, in debt investments. We've seen it had a very nice tailwind for quite a long time. And now that we have rising interest rates and rising inflations, as I mentioned in one of my printed commentary that went out several months ago, that tailwind has now turned into a headwind. And it's something that I think is going to be on the nose of our aircraft for some time. And it may shift from time to time, as it does when you're on a plane going out somewhere you, you want to go quickly. But, you know, it can definitely change to a headwind, and it can slow your trip down quite a bit. So I think if we just modify our expectations and we understand that those rates are going to be a little lower, then we can make better decisions by confronting the reality of this new environment that we're in. I agree. I think modifying our expectations is extremely important. And I know you briefly touched on it, but we're working hard in the trading room. I'm um, getting competitive rates out there and really adding that to each of our investors' portfolio. I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm a younger guy, so four, four to five percent might not sound too exciting to some of our investors that are in retirement and have seen more than me, but it is exciting to add that piece to a portfolio and to start earning some on cash again, like you said. So it's something we're working hard in the trading room and we'll continue to adapt to as we enter 2024. Well, Jack, I really enjoyed this episode and I appreciate all your great insight and comments and what you do in the trading room. You know, working hard for that additional few percentage points ahead of those banks that aren't paying anything adds a lot of value to our clients. So thank you for what you do every day. And I know our clients appreciate it. And thank you to all of our clients for taking time to listen today on our very special holiday edition of the Rudd Commentary. If you enjoyed this episode or learned something new, please take time to rate our podcast and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or your preferred podcast platform and never miss an episode. Also, if you know any other investors who would enjoy the show, please share the Red Commentary podcast through email or on social media. We would also like feedback on our program and ideas for future topics. If you have the time, we would enjoy hearing from you. All of us at Steer Wealth would like to thank you, our investors and clients, for your trust. Thank you for allowing us to be your partner in your long-term financial journey. We take this role very seriously. Thank you very much for listening today. This is the Rudd Commentary. I'm your host, Josh Rudd. And from all of us here at Steer Wealth, have a wonderful Christmas and a joyful start to the new year. This commentary is distributed for informational purposes only and is not intended to constitute legal, tax, accounting, or investment advice. Nothing herein constitutes any offer to sell or solicitation of any offer to buy any security. 
All investment strategies and investments involve risk of loss, including the possible loss of principal invested, and nothing herein should be construed as a guarantee of any specific outcome or profit. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Any opinions expressed by employees of the Rudd Company are the Rudd Company's opinions and do not reflect the opinions of any affiliates. The opinions expressed by guest speakers are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Rudd Company or any affiliates. Guest appearances on this program does not imply the Rudd Company's endorsement of any entity, person, product, service, or investment. All opinions are current and only as of the date of recording and are subject to change without notice.